Your Excellency, former President of India, Ambassador, and now I'm not going to say ladies and gentlemen, but I'm going to say women and gentlemen. Everyone who participated yesterday's dinner to understand very well why I'm doing so. Probably one of our Indian guests is going to explain why it is, it is reasonable to say women and, and gentlemen. But uh, I'm very proud to have an opportunity to open this uh, uh, event, which is going to be final phase of uh, Citrus India program, which started uh, three years ago. When we speak about India, uh, we quite often look at the presence of India and the future perspectives of that uh, country. But I collected some facts about the country, which shows what kind of huge impact India has had in the, in the global arena. First fact is quite interesting one. India has never invaded any country in her last 10,000 years history. <laughs> India has invented number system and the value of P uh, it was first calculated by the Indian mathematician Budhayana. Sanskrit is the mother of all the uh, European languages. Again, the fact is that the four religions are born in, in India. Hinduism, Buddhism, Chinese and, uh, and Sikhism. These four religions are followed by 25% of the world's population. And the world's first university was established in Takshashila in 700 before Christ. So that when we speak about this university, its history started 1640, if I remember correct. So this is brand new university compared with this first one in the, in the world. And one piece of uh, information which is not that well known today, uh, until the beginning of the uh, 17th century, India one, was one of the richest countries in the world. And uh, India is the largest English-speaking nation in the, in the world. That is also quite exciting fact. And finally, if you look at the list of the largest employers in, in the world, the biggest company in the world is, is the Indian railway system employing more than one, billion, one million people. These are quite exciting facts about India and it shows what kind of long history India has and what kind of role it has played in, in, in the history of uh, mankind. Then Finland and India, when we started our program, quite often we were asked, how come Citra is starting to invest in India or putting its efforts for, for India? India is a huge country compared uh, with, with Finland. I have uh, quite often told a nice story from, from Israel. One Israeli uh, venture capitalist came to meet me uh, couple of months ago and, and he told that uh, his company has activities in, in China and Singapore. And when he went to China, he was asked, how come Israeli company is interested to collaborate with uh, Chinese financial institutions? And he said that he didn't find out immediately any better explanation, but he said that together we are strong. It's a good good collaboration because together Israeli and Chinese institutions are strong. The Chinese host was asking immediately, what is the number of population in, in, in Israel? And when he heard that it is roughly five million, he started to calculate how long time it takes for, for China 
to have additional 5 million uh, people. And uh, if I remember correct, it was less than two months, a couple of weeks. Uh, roughly the same is the situation between Finland and, and India. India's land area is 10 times larger than, than ours. The population of India is 200 times bigger than ours. And if you take uh, population uh, younger than 16 years, India has 400 times larger population of that age group than ours. Uh, India has 22 officially recognized languages, which is uh, not very well known in, in, in uh, uh, Europe or in uh, Finland. When we started our program, we tried to engage and dialogue with the diversity of India. For us who have visited India, I think the most impressive thing is the fact that India is more or less like a continent. If Finland is a club, it is said that Finland is not a nation, it's a club. You can say in the same way that India is not a nation, it's a continent. Continent with uh, different languages, different religious uh, groups, different, different uh, ideological uh, backgrounds. It's the biggest democracy in, in, the, in the world. We wanted to, to um, engage a dialogue with uh, this diversity of India. We spent time discovering India and we tried to report about that to the Finnish audience. But we wanted to identify not only economic aspects of India, which are today uh, on the top of the agenda everywhere in the world, but we want to to look at social and human aspects as, as well. If you look at Finland and India and you try to find similarities, I, be, I believe that the main similarities are in our intellectual history. Both nations have been in a position that they had to invest and they have wanted to invest in intellectual capacity. Uh, the history of Finland, especially since the late 19th century, has been based on the idea that we can become strong actor, not only not on the basis of our physical capacity, but on our intellectual capacity. We expected that one day we are going to be independent from the Russian Empire, not by force, but by using our uh, intellectual capacity. That's why universities, education have played such an important role in the history of Finland. And I believe that this is one of the similarities because we have the feeling that if India is something, it is a nation based on, on uh, intellectual capacity and it is highly valued in the Indian uh, society. But we try to find out as well commercially relevant dimensions where Finland and India could be collaborators and partners, not only today, but especially on the, on the longer term in the, in the future. Ram Kulkarni on, on my team will share a little more detailed what we did and how we explored this issue of complementary relevance. But we have touched areas like healthcare, clean technologies, and energy, which are extremely promising areas of collaboration between Finland and, and India. Uh, women and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to, to wish you all welcome to this uh, final event of our program. Especially, I'm honored to, to invite the former president of India to, to make a speech in our conference. This is a, this is a great privilege for, for us at, at CITRA. What is this event? Now I will quote Winston Churchill, and I hope that I can do it in a in correct way, because this is very complicated 
a phrase he used. Sometimes during the Second World War, he had a speech in the, in the British Parliament, and he tried to illustrate in what phase the war actually was. And um, we can use this wording in peaceful meaning as well, like in this case of uh, our India program. W what phase we have reached by, by this program. For the first, this is not the end. We know that this is not the end of something. This is not the beginning of the end. But if this is something, it is the end of the beginning. The end of the beginning, which is going to create huge opportunities in the, in the, in the future. I don't believe that Citra's efforts as such are so important. But what is very important, we have been able to create larger interest in India, in, in Finland, and there are a lot of uh, uh, private sector actors, there are a lot of uh, institutions in Finland who have uh, recognized what a, what a huge opportunity India includes. Now that it's right time to act, and we hope that we, this program has been able to initiate a lot of uh, future activities between uh, Finland and India. Women and gentlemen, you are warmly welcome to this event. And now I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Pradeep Singh, the ambassador of India, to make his speech or to, to uh, greet our uh, conference. Mr. Ambassador, please. Mr. Esko Aho, <clears throat> and distinguished guests, I'm sidestepping the diplomatic hurdle of addressing you as ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege to be able to participate in this important event, which marks the conclusion of Sitra's India program. This program has uh, facilitated a series of activities, research papers, seminars and exchange of visits, which has contributed to a better understanding of the economic and industrial developments that are taking place in India. Simultaneously, it has given its Indian interlocutors a clearer idea of the areas and modalities of furthering bilateral cooperation in areas of mutual benefit to the peoples of the two countries. However, as you have said, Mr. Escoaho, we hope that this is not the end of the beginning, but the beginning of a long, mutually beneficial cooperation between our two countries. It is therefore a great honor for us to receive the honorable former president of the Republic of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam to Helsinki, who will grace the occasion with a keynote address. There is little that is not known about the eminence of a personality like Dr. Abdul Kalam. He has been a visionary head of state of the largest democracy in the world from 2002 to 2007 and has indeed been an inspiration for different generations, not only for the citizens of my country, but indeed for the entire international community. His statesmanship and sagacity, together with his humility and sensitivity, have made him a role model for the entire nation, irrespective of region, age, or religion. A quote from 
Dr. Abdul Kalam's own poem entitled Rock Walls reflects his vision. And I quote him, he says, I have no house, only open spaces, filled with truth, kindness, and dreams. Desire to see my country developed and great. Dreams to see everywhere happiness and peace." Unquote. Sitra's activities have complemented other bilateral initiatives which has transformed the traditionally friendly relations between India and Finland into a dynamic partnership based on a high-level political dialogue, growth in trade and investments, and a diversification in the areas of our cooperation now to include science and technology, CDM, information security, and other important infrastructural sectors. I'm also happy to report that bilateral trade between India and Finland in 2007 reflects a 32% increase over the previous year, and by over 50%, over the last three years. We are confident that this is, that there is considerable potential for further growth. Two-way investments are constantly increasing and the growing presence of Indian companies in Finland and Finnish companies in India is an encouraging sign. We value Finland's spirit of innovation, transparency and competitiveness and we seek partnerships in technological development. Domestically, in India, we continue to be optimistic about our continued economic development. Our finance minister has recently presented the country's budget to the parliament, which has three broad parameters. The first being to consolidate the policies to sustain the country's economic growth and to integrate it more effectively with the global economy. Secondly, to ensure, and this is very important, inclusiveness and improve the living conditions of the underprivileged sections of the Indian society through generations, through generation of employment, broadening of education and health schemes. And thirdly, to control inflation and rise in prices. And this is a particular challenge considering the inflationary pressures due to the global rise in oil and other commodity prices coupled with the appreciation of the Indian rupee in relation to the US dollar as also the ripple effect of a global economic slowdown. Special emphasis is also being given by my government to the development of infrastructure and industry, especially in the generation of energy to sustain the present growth levels. Additional capacity for power generation and rural electrification has been provided for, as well as oil and gas exploration. While India has the fifth largest electricity generation capacity in the world, the low per capita consumption is still a concern. Our present estimates are that we will require over 90,000 megawatts of new generation capacity in the next seven years to be able to meet the growing demands of our economy. Another important area of our government's focus has been education and the further development of our human resource capital. It is widely recognized that India has large technically trained manpower, which is available at the most competitive wage levels. The demographic profile, which has been referred to, of my country is also favorable, and India is projected to remain the youngest with its working age population right through to the foreseeable future. The country is expected to have an additional 200 million people, therefore, entering the job markets. India presently has over 300 universities 
and 1,500 research institutes. The government in the present budget has increased the outlay on education by 20%. This will result in the establishment of 16 new central universities in my country this year and three new Indian Institutes of Technology, which many of you may be aware are recognized world-class engineering centers, and these will be located in the states of Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, and Rajasthan. Two new schools of planning architecture will also be set up, and the National Knowledge Network will connect all knowledge centers in the country via broadband. The prognosis, therefore, for the continued development of India, Finland, commercial and economic relations continues to be strong and promising. I have no doubt that the contribution being made by Sitra in this regard will play an important role. Allow me again to congratulate Sitra and particularly its dynamic president, Mr. Escoajo, whose personal commitment to the development of business relationships between India and Finland and inspiring leadership has assured the success of this promising partnership. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the rest of the event.